Good evening. I'm Bill Maley, Brighton Supervisor, and I'm so pleased to welcome all of you here tonight to the March 11, 2015 Brighton Town Board meeting. Welcome. I thank all of you that are here in the audience, um, but I also want to thank uh, the people that are at home or somewhere else watching us streaming on the internet or on our uh, cable access channel. Uh, we appreciate all the ways per people uh, can participate in our meetings. I would note that if you're here in the room, the agenda as well as all of the supporting materials are in the folder on the uh, rear table. Uh, if you're watching on your TV or on your computer, um, the full agenda for tonight and all of our backup material are available on the Town of Brighton webpage at townofbrighton.org. Uh, and uh, just a note, uh, we do put our board meetings up on YouTube, so uh, feel free later. You can watch not only on our webpage itself, but also on YouTube on the Town of Brighton's channel. In a minute, we'll be starting with our open forum portion of the meeting. We always welcome uh, questions, comments, whether they're about matters on the agenda or not during that open forum portion of the meeting, but we'll be getting to that in just a moment. Right now, I'd like to start with a pledge to the flag, and I'm going to ask Town Board Member uh, Chris Warner to lead us, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I want to let everybody know that in case of an emergency, you will hear the town hall emergency alarm system activated. If you hear the alarm, please um, exit the auditorium either to my right through the exit door marked there, turn right, go down the stairs and out the rear entrance, or through either of the double doors in the rear of the building, go straight ahead, out the front uh, entrance to town hall, down the steps, and away from the building. Now we do occasionally experience technical difficulties during the live cable broadcast of this uh, meeting. Uh, if you do experience any such difficulties, please call Time Warner Cable. Their number is 756-5000. Again, 756-5000. We're going to start tonight before we get to the open forum. Uh, we have a proclamation, uh, and then I will be giving the 2015 State of the Town Address. But we'll start with that proclamation first. It's certainly appropriate that our County Executive Maggie Brooks is here tonight uh, because this proclamation does recognize Women's History Month. The month of March is Women's History Month. And of course, the Rochester area has a long tradition of great women in history, Susan B. Anthony just being one of a long, long and very important list. Uh, but tonight, I get great, real personal pleasure in the opportunity to recognize someone that uh, has played a major role in cataloging, chronicling the history of Brighton and of Rochester, and certainly one of Rochester's greatest citizens, uh, George Eastman. Uh, Betsy Brayer, uh, I had the pleasure of working with as she served on Brighton's Historic Preservation Commission for many, many years. Uh, so I'm going to read this, Betsy, if you'd like to come up and join me. Whereas each year during the month of March, we remember, honor, and celebrate the many accomplishments of our nation's women. Whereas Women's History Month is a time to acknowledge and celebrate the contributions of all women and to increase awareness and understanding of issues of concern to women and those women in particular who have and have continued to play a significant role in the education and the preservation of history of our community, our state, and our nation. Whereas the town of Brighton is proud to be home to many women 
who are committed to raising historic preservation awareness and instilling a sense of pride in our, nation's, in our area's unique history. Whereas the town, and certainly all of us on the town board, consider Elizabeth Betsy Breyer to be one such woman. Based on her service on our Historic Preservation Commission from 1997 to 2012, her service as past chair and current board member of Historic Brighton since 2000, and her more than 18 years of service as a member on both the George Eastman Legacy and Landscape Committees at the George Eastman House International Museum of Photography and Film, and as past historian of the George Eastman House. And whereas an award-winning author, editor, and preservation advocate, Betsy Breyer became interested in George Eastman as an arts reporter, critic, and editor, published a 43-part series on building the George Eastman House, and authored the 1996 Pulitzer Prize-nominated book, George Eastman, a Biography. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that I, William W. Maley, Brighton Town Supervisor, and all of the members of our town council to hereby recognize March as Women's History Month in the town of Brighton. And we applaud Elizabeth Betsy Breyer for all of your accomplishments. And we thank and honor you for all that you have done and all that you continue to do to preserve our history through your work. And this proclamation is signed by myself and the members of the Brighton Town Board this 11th day of March. 2015. Betsy, for all that you have done. Well, is it on? Okay. Is it on? Good. And, it, and you can even pull it out. Would, would you like to pull it out here? We'll go hands free. Oh, okay. There you go. I just wanted to thank you, Bill. And I wanted to say that my living in Brighton for the past 60 years and being fascinated by local history even longer seems to have been preordained when I was five years old. In 1938, the state of Delaware celebrated the 300th anniversary of the first Swedish settlements there. My Pennsylvania cousins came for the weekend, and we all went down to the docks, an old Swedes church, with a Swedish flag in one hand and an American flag in the other. Delaware, you understand, is represented by the first star on the American flag. All in all, local history seemed the most exciting thing that ever happened to a five-year-old. <laughs> well, the Crown Prince of Sweden was supposed to come out on the deck of his yacht and address us, but he was sick and didn't show. But there were musicians and music composed especially for the occasion by a Swedish-American named Howard Hansen. Imagine my surprise when 19 years later, I moved to Brighton, New York, and found that this very same Howard Hansen lived here too, and that he had Sunday dinner every week at Howard Johnson's, and Sunday supper with my new in-laws at the Country Club of Rochester. How exciting can local history be? When I Googled Howard Hansen's name recently, I learned that after he composed the Hymn of the Pioneers to celebrate the 300th anniversary of the first Swedish settlement in Delaware, he was selected as a fellow of the Royal Swedish Academy. Thank you. Betsy, thank you so much. I do want to present you with this proclamation. All right. We thank you. And you know, <laughs> Betsy mentions, obviously, Howard Hansen. But I think it's important to remember, and you 
also talked about an icon that those of us that have been around in Brighton for a while will also remember, Howard Johnson's. <laughs> every day, it's the little things. We live history every day. And Betsy Breyer, you have done so much to remind people of that Brighton's history, through the work you've done, is just as important as the fancy subjects we may study in uh, history classes in school. Absolutely. The world we live in, the town we live in, the people we meet, the restaurants we go to are a part of our history just as much as what we learn in those classes. Thank you for bringing that home to us. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. I'm pleased to uh, present the State of the Town of Brighton address to all of you this evening. And the State of the Town of Brighton is brighter than it has ever been. And this year I come to share with you my optimistic assessment of how we're doing today, but more importantly, why I believe that the future of Brighton has never been brighter. I want to acknowledge the many town partners that are here tonight. We work with so many different organizations, the Brighton Central School District and our school board, the Kiwanis, the Rotary Club, Brighton Neighbors United, the Chamber of Commerce. And there are representatives from some of these organizations here tonight. And the work you do with us makes such a difference in the quality of life of this community. I also acknowledge the relationships that we share with other governments, particularly with the state of New York and with Monroe County. Uh, I welcome our county executive, Maggie Brooks, here tonight, uh, as well as assistant county executive and Brighton resident, William Napier. Um, county legislator Paul Haney is with us tonight as well. Thank you, Paul. Kate Munzinger is here as a representative of Senator Joe Robach. Uh, again, in these difficult times, the opportunity to partner with other government and collaborate with those entities to get work done in Brighton and in other communities is really more important than ever. Uh, the governor's tax cap and tax freeze programs require that local governments demonstrate financial savings from cooperation in order to qualify for the community rebates that are available under the tax freeze program starting this coming year. County Executive Brooks, uh, Rochester Mayor Lovely Warren, and each of their staffs, along with all of the local government members of the Monroe County Council of Governments, have been working to quantify the savings in order to get those savings recognized by the state so that we all can qualify if we keep our tax levy increases in line with the tax cap for those tax-free savings. And I appreciate uh, the county executive, your work, and the mayor in, in coordinating those efforts and making that possible. I certainly can say that those efforts at local cooperation have already paid off in efficiencies for our town operations and in enhanced revenues that also benefit town taxpayers. And I'm now confident that going forward, we will see uh, those efforts of the mayor and the county executive and the rest of the government entities and the council paying off in satisfying the state's requirements under the tax freeze. Now in 2014, we looked back to celebrate Brighton's first 200 years. And I do want to acknowledge the chair of that effort, Ray Tierney, who is in the house tonight, former council member. Thank you, Ray, for all that you did. Thousands of Brighton residents and others attended those activities during the years. But as we planned our bicentennial activities and throughout our year-long celebration, we focused in on involving school students of Brighton in the bicentennial because we wanted our bicentennial to focus not just on 200 years of history, 
we wanted to engage students so we and they could learn together how Brighton's history and how our current successes as a community could pave the way in a way to plan for our future, a future that those students of today will not only live, but lead. Tonight I focus on the future of Brighton for ourselves, but more particularly for our children and for our grandchildren. And I do so knowing that our future will be built on the decisions we make today and the plans we make for tomorrow. Now 2014 was not only a year in which we celebrated 200 years of Brighton history, but it was also a year in which we laid the groundwork for what will be several transformative projects for the town of Brighton. Together, these projects will reinforce Brighton's reputation as a community of neighborhoods, a community with a strong commercial main street along Monroe Avenue, and a community dedicated to our neighborhoods and our schools, a diverse community of families of all kinds who feel right at home here in Brighton. The centerpiece of Brighton's transformation is our Monroe Avenue Green Infrastructure Project. Funded with a state economic development grant of approximately $1.6 million, we began work relating to this project last year with a pilot project in front of Citizens Bank. Now it's buried under the snow now, but the pilot project incorporated the elements of the Green Infrastructure Project that will ultimately line Monroe Avenue from the 12 corners to Allen's Creek Road or as we like to look at it, from Allen's Creek to Buckland Creek, because ultimately this is a stormwater project that will pay great dividends in many ways to the community. When that project is complete, you'll see porous sidewalk, the kind that is now there in front of the Citizens Bank. That porous sidewalk will allow stormwater to seep through into the ground rather than sheeting off onto Monroe Avenue where it forms messy puddles and eventually flows into our stormwater system, taking accumulated oil and other pollutants with it. That porous pavement in and of itself will make a significant positive impact on our stormwater performance. And if you drove down Monroe Avenue today and it's only going to get worse, the ponding, the puddling is very real. Also as part of that project, we'll be establishing a linear rain garden between the new porous sidewalk and the highway pavement, which will add greenery to enhance further stormwater performance, but also to improve the appearance of the avenue, because it's going to replace that ugly asphalt that lines much of Monroe Avenue today. That, <laughs> thank you. That's also going to, and I think this is very important, it will enhance traffic safety. The driver along Monroe Avenue, instead of seeing that, it, uh, that expanse of pavement that's there today, <coughs> will see natural plantings in what we've come to know as a tree lawn. And that will slow traffic and make pedestrians feel safer along Monroe Avenue, having that green buffer between them and the streets, uh, the cars and the trucks going down the street. When the project is completed, You'll also see overlooks at Bucklands Creek and Allen's Creek, where the two creeks cross Monroe Avenue, along with interpretive signage. This will enhance the work that the school district and the community have already done to enhance the appearance of Buckland Creek as it runs through the Brighton Central School District campus at the 12 corners. Further east along Monroe Avenue, in 2014, the State Department of Transportation made significant safety and infrastructure improvements to Monroe Avenue between Westfall Road and Clover Street. As part of that project, the state installed new sidewalks along Monroe Avenue, improving a dangerous area for cars and pedestrians alike. Now, as much as I am pleased that this project has improved traffic safety in the area, my concern then and now, still, is the new left turn that was added onto 590 South from Monroe Avenue uh, westbound. That new left turn and that ramp duplicates an existing right lane ramp onto I-590 a few hundred feet down Monroe Avenue. 
not only does this new left turn defeat the purpose of improving safety, because a left turn across traffic is always problematic, but it also changed the timing of traffic signals in the area. And as a result, traffic backups, and again, even though as safety has improved, traffic backups in the area have not. And I think in significant part, that's a function of the timing of those lights with that new left turn added. I have called on the State Department of Transportation, and I repeat that call tonight, to re-examine the need for that left turn. But in any event, to thoroughly review and modify the timing of traffic lights in that area as needed to better accommodate traffic along Monroe Avenue. <clears throat> now the new Brickyard Trail is an exciting and significant project for the town, one in which town staff has invested significant planning time during 2014 and one which we will work hard to complete in 2015. The Brickyard Trail will run from Elmwood Avenue to Westfall Road connecting Town Hall and nearby Central Brighton neighborhoods with Buckland Park through approximately 72 acres of land acquired by the town in 2013. That land was mined for the clay that supported Brighton's brickmaking industry during the 19th century. Just last night, dozens of neighbors attended a final information meeting on this project and they gave our plans and our consultants' plans a big collective thumbs up. The open house format that the town now regularly uses gave everyone present an opportunity to speak one-on-one -on -one with our town staff and with the project consultants. And it provides much more input than we would receive in a traditional formal meeting setting. Like any open house, it also allows people to come when they want and to leave when they want. Now this trail, for those of you that saw the designs last night, and if you didn't, I invite you to our website, brightontrail.com. The trail will include interpretive signage and interpretive trailheads and a chance to ride the rail line because much of the trail follows the path of the narrow gauge rail line that served those 19th century clay mines, taking the clay dredged from this beautiful parcel of land out to Monroe Avenue, to the brickyards. Now once the final historic and environmental review and approvals have been finalized, and we're close, <coughs> construction will begin later this year, and we expect to open the trail before year end. A portion of the cost will be funded by a grant obtained with the help of our good friend, Assembly Majority Leader, Joe Morelli. Joe couldn't be here tonight, but we thank you for all that you do to support the town of Brighton. 2014 was also the year in which dedicated town employees and our very talented community volunteers began the work of updating Brighton's comprehensive plan. The project will continue through 2015 with public input and a lot of hard work before receiving formal town adoption when the plan is completed in 2016. That plan will be a roadmap for town government and for the community at large as we make long-range planning decisions for Brighton's future based on concepts of sustainability, the redevelopment of aging or obsolete built environment and community facilities, and also enhancing our active transportation infrastructure. We make these planning decisions in a world of limited resources, but with a well-thought-out comprehensive plan one that includes broad public input and professional guidance, we can more effectively choose our way forward. Once again, I'm pleased to uh, say that the town received a $150,000 grant for this <coughs> comprehensive plan update from the Regional Economic Development Grant Program based on Brighton's commitment to smart planning for our future. Leading the way on all of these important projects is our Department of Public Works. From engineering to planning to architecture to today's most modern information technologies, our DPW is serving the community in new ways and familiar ones. I want to thank our Commissioner of Public Works, Tim Keefe, who wears many hats. Tim serves as our Commissioner of Public Works, our Highway Superintendent, and our Superintendent of Sewers. And Ramsey, please convey our appreciation for all of that work to Tim. 
But I also want to thank all of his planning, engineering, and leadership team, Ramsey, including yourself, who have been committed to seeing these projects through to success. We have a number of the volunteers that are involved in some of those projects, and I want to thank each of you for being here tonight. Now, we're not here just to pat ourselves on the back. So I think this is also a good time to discuss an area where, frankly, despite a lot of hard work from the men and women that work in our highway department, we need to do better. And that's our leaf pickup. Now, in 2014, the Rochester area had the second latest killing frost ever. Why is that important? It means that the leaves fell later this year than probably any season ever. Now, although we've updated our website for more comprehensive and user-friendly information to residents as to when our trucks will be picking up leaves in our neighborhoods, and although our highway employees worked as hard as they ever have, I was not satisfied with our performance in leaf pickup this year. And frankly, I know neither were a number of you. And in many cases, some of you weren't shy about letting me know, and that's okay. We're committed to improving those operations in 2015. And therefore, I've directed Tim Keefe, our, uh, our commissioner, to begin to develop a plan to improve our performance this coming fall. One of those decisions we had already made, as we developed our budget for 2015, we restored much of the overtime that many years ago had been allocated to leaf pickup but which was removed from the budget at the height of the financial crisis. We've restored that. Second, I've asked Tim to review our LEAF operations uh, in a comprehensive, holistic way, specifically including a review of equipment alternatives, including vacuum LEAF removal. We did a study several years ago, but new equipment is available, better technology. We're going to take another look. Now, it's important to, keep, uh, to remind the community that we keep sustainability in mind as part of our leaf removal process. Our leaves are taken to our landfill. They're mulched. I think it's also to important to remind everybody that we do circulate four times through the entire town of Brighton to pick up leaves, sometimes the, even after the snow is, has fallen on them. Not every community does that. Some of our neighbors come through town once or twice. In some cases, not at all. We think it's important, and we think it's important to do so in a sustainable way. We also think it's important to conduct lawn and garden debris pickup throughout the year, seasonal conditions permitting. We know it's a big undertaking. We know that it's a service you expect for the tax dollars you pay us. It's a service we remain committed to and it's a service we remain committed to doing right. Speaking of doing it right, the Brighton Police Department is second to none when it comes to law enforcement agencies, not just in the Rochester area, but throughout the state of New York. The recently issued 2014 annual report of the Police Department demonstrates the impact that our Police Department has in important areas of public safety in Brighton. Statistics tell part of the story, and there's a lot of statistics in that report. Burglaries, a crime that generates great attention because of the very personal nature of the act of a burglary, were down significantly in 2014 for the second straight year. There may be a lot of causes for that, but I think it's important that the success that the Brighton Police Department has had, often in collaboration with other law enforcement agencies, in concluding investigation around past burglaries has taken criminals off the street. Neighborhood meetings that Chief Henderson, other members of his staff, and myself have held have also helped because every time we're out in the neighborhood, we remind our friends, if you see something, if you see something out of the ordinary, say something. Call 911. Do it right away. Now, conversely, when you go through those statistics, you'll also see a dramatic increase this past year in DWI arrests in 2014. That demonstrates 
that focused attention to this crime and it is a serious crime leads to a significantly enhanced numbers of arrests but it also leads to greater community awareness and ultimately safer driving that effort's going to continue now i don't claim to have a crystal ball but good police work is about a lot more than just statistics in last year's state of the town address i went beyond the statistics to emphasize the importance of community engagement in evaluating just how effectively our Brighton Police Department does its job. Since that time, we've seen incidents in Ferguson, on Staten Island, and most recently in Madison, Wisconsin, that demonstrate the importance of real community engagement for effective police work. Through the community engagement initiative that Chief Henderson started in 2013, and through other efforts, including directed training <clears throat> Rochester's Center for Dispute Settlement and a track record of diversity in our hiring practices, <clears throat> the Brighton Police Department continues to build community relationships with all parts of our diverse community. And in doing so, the department enhances its ability to do their job of protecting us more effectively. I want to thank Police Chief Mark Henderson for your professionalism and your leadership in everything that you do in the toughest job in town hall. And Mark, in thanking you, I thank you and the entire Brighton Police Department on behalf of the entire town board, but more importantly, on behalf of the entire Brighton community. We respect and we honor the men and women of our Brighton Police Department who put themselves and their lives on the line every single day to serve the people of Brighton. Thank you. Police Department works hand in glove with other public safety agencies serving Brighton. The Brighton Fire Department, the Brighton Volunteer Ambulance, and the Rochester Fire Department, which provides quality service in West Brighton. And I want to acknowledge uh, Chief Schreiber from the Rochester Police Department who was here tonight. Thank fire you. Uh, fire Department, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chief. We appreciate all that you and your staff do in keeping not only West Brighton, but all of us safer. Maintaining the financial strength of the town is vital if we're to continue to maintain the quality of life we've come to expect here in Brighton. The New York tax cap first took effect in the 2012 cycle, the year I became supervisor. And I'm pleased to say that once again in 2014, the town of Brighton budget and the tax levy met the state tax cap stayed under the state tax cap. Brighton rated highly on the state stress test measurement that our controller has recently begun. And we've maintained our AA2 bond rating from Moody's. All of these metrics demonstrate a commitment by your town government to maintaining Brighton's fiscal strength and stability. But let me put it into some numbers. When the town of Brighton chose to borrow last year on a short-term basis, we did so partly because, based on our strong credit rating, we knew we would get an attractive interest rate. And in fact, we were very pleased when the auction concluded and we were able to borrow at a rate of only three quarters of one percent. That is a vote of confidence from the financial markets in the way we manage our finances every day here in Brighton. I appreciate the volunteer members of Brighton's Budget Review Task Force, who again reviewed capital and budget requests as an integral part of our budget development <coughs> and capital improvement plan development process. This year they even took a long field trip of town facilities to give them an up close and personal look and a better grasp of the magnitude of the capital investment needed to maintain our essential services. I thank each of you for giving your time and sharing your talents with us. And that goes, by the way, for the volunteers that serve on all of the great boards of the town of Brighton, planning, zoning, conservation, ad hoc boards that we have. 
your efforts enable us to do a better job every day. But getting back to finance, that work is led by a finance and budget staff team that has proven themselves to be simply the best. Finance Director Suzanne Zaso, Budget Director Andrew Robinson. Although the budget development process spans several months of year, the town's finance department works year-round to ensure that there is continuous oversight over spending decisions by departments, that all government accounting standards and procedures are followed, so that each year our auditor returns a clean audit report, and making sure that our purchasing practices continue to meet all legal and policy requirements, not only of the state, but also of the town of Brighton itself. The finance department primarily serves the other departments in the town, and therefore most members of the community never interact with the outstanding members of our finance team. But Suzanne, your service is invaluable to everything else we do in managing the town, and please share our appreciation with your entire staff. Each year in this address, I touch on the importance of enhancing our tax base as we fight to keep taxes in check in the face of cost increases. <clears throat> Last year, the total assessed valuation of real property in Brighton, in Brighton grew by only 0.65%, in other words, 65 one-hundredths of 1%. One Slow-growing property tax bases are common in inner-ring suburbs like Brighton, but they do burden our ability to continue to provide essential high quality services to our residents. <coughs> we continue to believe that smart, sustainable growth policies will enhance our property tax base growth in Brighton growing forward without significant negative impacts on our environment or on our negatives, on our neighborhoods, sorry. Anything but negatives. Where appropriate, we will continue to entertain incentive zoning applications. Incentive zoning, which was first authorized by the state about 25 years ago, has been a tool that Brighton has used to customize development in a way that makes it fit in the community, but also ensures that it plays its fair share, offsetting impacts on the community with amenities that have enhanced Brighton's quality of life. Just as an example, without incentive zoning, Brighton would not have the park system that it has today nor would it have the developed amenities in that park system. We will continue to use this tool, but I cannot stress enough the open process that Brighton has followed and will continue to follow in the incentive zoning review process is what makes it so effective. No incentive zoning proposal is a done deal. Let me repeat that. No incentive zoning proposal is ever a done deal until it receives extensive planning board and zoning and uh, town board review involving open public hearings. The town board considers potential community impacts of development, which can include increased traffic, loss of open space, and environmental challenges against the potential positive impacts of project amenities and tax revenues. In a time of limited resources, and the severe constraint of the tax cap, tax freeze, we would be irresponsible not to take potential property tax revenues into account, but as one factor only when considering new development proposals. In particular, we will expect applicants for new incentive zoning projects to commit to mutually agreeable arrangements with RGRTA for bus service to minimize the traffic generation impacts of new development and to enhance bus service throughout Brighton. We will expect significant not-for-profit entities seeking incentive zoning approvals to make enhanced lieu of tax payments to the town. And we will expect residential incentive zoning projects to incorporate affordable housing in order to help alleviate the over-concentration of affordable housing in impoverished urban neighborhoods. The Town of Brighton is a member of the New York State Association of Towns, and I'm proud to serve as an active member of the Association's Executive Committee. One of the many roles that the Association plays is as an advocate 
for issues affecting towns at the state and federal government level. An issue that I've pushed since taking office, elimination of the tax loophole for condominiums, is also an important part of the legislative agenda of the Association of Towns to ensure fairness for all taxpayers. I also urge reform for industrial development agencies to ensure that benefited projects provide tangible, incremental economic development impacts. Businesses that accept IDA benefits should be held to verifiable standards of prevailing wages paid to local workers. New tax revenue from development can be elusive if Comita tax subsidies granted without local consent undermine our town and our schools. I call on Comita to work with local government to ensure the proposed tax base actually meet local community needs. Brighton is indeed a healthy community, but I would be remiss if I did not address the community-wide crisis that is poverty. The Center for Governmental Research Study on Poverty, completed in late 2013, primarily drafted by Ed Doherty, and that study was updated just weeks ago, paints a stark picture of poverty in the Rochester area. Perhaps the most telling aspect of that study is the impact of concentration of our poverty on our community's children. More than half of the children in Rochester live in poverty. Let that number sink in. Picture the children you see the next time you drive past a playground. Half of those children. And make no mistake, those children have done nothing to deserve the poverty that impacts every single aspect of their young lives. And again, make no mistake, although poverty is concentrated in the urban core of Rochester, Poverty, often hidden poverty, is very much present in Brighton and in other suburbs. And the indirect impacts of the concentrated poverty in urban Rochester has persistent impacts on us all. Making sure that transit facilities, well-paid jobs, and affordable housing are available in Brighton is one way that we meet our larger obligation to the community as a whole. And well thought out incentive zoning proposals can help us achieve those objectives. Incentive zoning can also be a tool to improve our infrastructure. But in an older community like Brighton, we must devote an ever increasing share of our revenues to maintaining the quality of our streets, sidewalks, sewers, and other infrastructure improvements as well as modernizing them to meet the needs of our modern life. Infrastructure maintenance and construction works best as a partnership among all levels of government. And I appreciate working with Monroe County on projects such as the Edgewood Avenue Bridge last year and the much needed Winton Road repaving that Monroe County will undertake this summer. And again, I want to thank you, uh, County Executive Brooks for the work we do together in the area of infrastructure. Families of all ages take advantage of the strong park system and recreation programs in the town of Brighton. After a year of special bicentennial events, the Recreation Department, under the leadership of Director Becky Cotter, has expanded its offerings this year, including new programming at the town's historic Buckland House, such as an African-American history event with the Buffalo Soldiers and a Women's History Month event just this past Sunday in partnership with ninth grade English students at Brighton High School who portrayed famous women in Brighton's history. Brighton is known for its park system from Corbett's Glen, the jewel of our park system in East Brighton, to the playing fields and natural 
passive recreation land of Buckland and Meridian Center Parks in Central Brighton, to Stowell Nature Conservancy in Lynchwood Park near the Genesee River in Brighton, in West Brighton. Park Superintendent Matt Beeman and his small but truly remarkable team of park employees maintain this spectacular system for the public to enjoy. And as I mentioned before, we're going to be adding one more jewel, the new Brickyard Trail in the 72-acre park right across the street here from Town Hall. Now, no list of Brighton's most popular activities would be complete without highlighting the Brighton Farmer's Market. The market successfully blends local agriculture with, as a community gathering place, winter and summer, at no net cost to Brighton taxpayers. The town has received grant funding with assistance from both Senator Joe Robach and Assembly Majority Leader Joe Morelli to explore and plan development of a new winter market facility on the grounds of the former farm in what is now Buckland Park. And we've begun the development of formal plans to reuse existing farm facilities at that site for the market, reinforcing the connection between Buckland Park and Brighton's agrarian history. Thank you, Sue Gardner-Smith, market and community garden director, for bringing the community together every single day at the community garden, well, at least every single day that the snow isn't laying on top of it, but every week, winter, spring, fall, and summer at our Brighton Farmer's Market. The Brighton Memorial Library is the library of choice for thousands of students, seniors, and families. Recognized as the best library in Monroe County and supported by hundreds of members of the Friends of the Brighton Memorial Library, and I'm proud to say that I'm a member myself, and card-carrying Monroe County Library System holder. The Brighton Memorial Library has adopted technology. You can check out books, sure, but you can check out Kindles, too. And the library is truly an educational resource for people of all ages. Executive Director Jennifer Reese Taggart deserves the community's thanks and appreciation for our great Brighton Memorial Library. The town of Brighton prides itself on open government and open communication with our residents. During the last three years, Brighton has been an early adopter of technology and particularly social media among local municipalities. Today, not only does the town itself have an active Facebook and Twitter presence, but the police department, fire department, fire marshal, and recreation department all have embraced social media. No town in Monroe County has a more active presence on social media than the town of Brighton, and I encourage residents to stay current and like or follow the town of Brighton's growing presence. Now today, we can all pull out our phones, we all know how important mobile has become. And the town is currently in the process of developing a mobile app with the goal of giving residents a, yet another way of communicating with their government no matter where you are. With all of these technological advances, traditionalists need not despair. We will continue with traditional communication in the Brighton Pittsburgh Post our quarterly newsletters, face-to-face -face community meetings in East and West Brighton, as well as our open forum at every single Brighton Town Board meeting. Assistant to the Supervisor and Community Liaison, Mary Ann Husser, Town Clerk Dan Amon, and Data Processing Coordinator Sue Wentworth will work with, together with me on our mobile app project, and I want to thank each of you because you each play an important role in enhancing, improving our position as the most open government in this area. We also take pride that Brighton is an inclusive committee, community, one that respects the civil rights of all. For that reason, in 2014, when the state legislature once again 
failed to grant equal civil rights to transgender New Yorkers. The town of Brighton adopted our Gender Expression Non-Discrimination Act, our GENDA local law. GENDA means that in Brighton, transgender individuals have the same civil protection from discrimination in housing, employment, accommodations, and in other areas. The same protection from discrimination that we all have, that we all should have. In the past, the town board has unanimously called on the state to pass this simple legislation statewide. We'll be doing it again tomorrow at an event down at City Hall with Mayor Lovely Warren. But because the state has failed to take action, we felt we had no choice but to take action here in Brighton. And we are once again proud to take the lead in civil rights here in the greater Rochester community, where the fight for civil rights for women and for African Americans is so much a part of our community's history. Now recently I became aware that Reverend Ann Cansfield, the first woman and first lesbian chaplain of the New York Fire Department, is a Brighton High School graduate. I had the opportunity to uh, talk online at some length with Reverend Canfield the other morning. And as proud as she is to have grown up here in Brighton, as proud as she is to have attended Brighton schools, she recounted negative incidents of bullying growing up during her youth. Adopting gender in Brighton is one more step we can take to ensure that our next generation of Brighton residents, our next generation of Brighton leaders and role models can grow up in an environment free of bullying and fear. Every single one of our students deserves nothing less. Every one of our residents, every person that makes use of services and facilities in this town deserves nothing less. My good friend town clerk Dan Amon can perhaps better be described as the town ombudsman because he and his office serve the people of Brighton in so many ways. He serves as the town's records access officer responsible for compliance with New York's Freedom of Information Law. His office issues permits and licenses of many kinds. You perform weddings and you collect millions of dollars of taxes every year. Most people who come to town hall in person are doing so to make use of the services in the town clerk's office. And it's a credit to Dan and your entire staff that people leave with their questions answered, problems solved, passports and licenses issued. Dan, no matter how invisible you occasionally feel, I greatly appreciate, and all of us greatly appreciate, the many hats that you wear and the many ways that you serve the people of Brighton. Thank you. Each of my four colleagues on the town board sitting beside me tonight put in countless hours meeting with community members, holding community meetings, or working with other community groups. Together we work as a team to answer resident questions or concerns and your town board members are always available to serve as your voice, to serve as your ear in reaching out to town government. Now although town board members do not have paid staff, they work hard to respond themselves directly to your needs as residents. For your commitment to the Brighton community, I want to thank my colleagues on the town board, Jason DePonzio, Chris Warner, Louise Novros, and Jim Vogel. It's a pleasure working with you. You're a credit to the community. Thank you. Our Brighton Town Court, right next door, has a history of excellence. And Judge Karen Morris and Judge John Falk, along with the able staff of our town court, handle an ever-increasing caseload and ensure a fair day in court for every person that has to come in. Judge Morris and Judge Falk each have years of professional experience and extensive legal expertise balanced with their personal life experiences. There is no finer court in any town in the state of New York. And that's a credit to Judge Morris and Judge Falk and to the outstanding jurists that served Brighton before them. 
Judge Morris and Judge Falk are both here tonight. I want to thank you for everything you do <coughs> in providing justice here in the Brighton community. I finish tonight where I began. <clears throat> Never has Brighton been stronger. Never have our opportunities been so exciting. Our financial strength, our pride and our respect for education, diversity and equal rights, our people and our neighborhoods make us the community that we are today. Tomorrow we'll make new history and I'm confident that in a hundred years our children's children will look back and see just how much today's Brighton residents cared about their community, just how much time and talent Brighton's residents today gave back to their community. You make Brighton strong, you make Brighton unique, a hometown we can all be proud of. Brighton is strong today because you have chosen to make Brighton your hometown. Thank you all for attending tonight and thank you all for being a part of this great community of Brighton. We'll now continue with the open forum portion of our meeting. Um, obviously all of our guests and friends are welcome to stay, but I understand that some of you may have other commitments, and please feel free. We appreciate your being here. But I do want to note that in our open forum, and I talked about it earlier, members of the audience may address the board about any matter, whether or not it's on our agenda tonight. Now if you're here to address a matter that is on the agenda for a public hearing, and then we do have a public hearing about the U of R project tonight. If you'd like your project, if you'd like your comments to be in the record for that public hearing, please wait until the hearing is held to give your comments for the record. Now during the open forum, I will recognize members of the audience wishing to speak. When recognized, please come to the podium. If you would, please give your name and address. Comments should be directed to the board and not to other members of the audience. Please be courteous and please try to keep your comments as concise as possible. Now I was remiss in not thanking our, uh, our uh, sign language interpreter uh, tonight. Suzanne did a great job and um, I don't know if she's left, but thank you very much for that. Now also, for our deaf and hearing impaired audience, as we always do, if you would like to call in during the open forum, please call 30, I'm sorry, our TDD line, 784-5205, our TDD line, 784-5205, if you would like to call in during the open forum uh, and need to use that TDD line. All other folks, we are happy to take your calls. Please call 303-3060. Someone will answer your call and relay your question to me. If we can answer it, we will. If not, we'll make every effort to get back to you as soon as we can. But in any event, we always look forward to hearing from you with any questions, comments, or concerns. So now we'll begin the open forum. Is there anyone that would like to address the town board in the open forum? Judy? Judy Schwartz, 179 Ashbourne Road. This ties in beautifully, Bill, with some of your comments um, tonight about poverty. I announced this a couple of weeks ago, but I want to do it again tonight. Um, Interfaith Impact of New York State holds a uh, legislative briefing every March, and this year our program is entitled Show Me the Money, Escalating Inequality Hurts. It's this Sunday, March 15th at 2 o'clock at the First Universalist Church downtown at 150 South Clinton, right near Washington Square and Jiva in the parking lot. Michael Kink, who is the Executive Director for Strong Economy for All Coalition, is going to be one of our presenters. He's a public interest attorney advisor to leading New York labor and community groups. Some of you may know Ann Johnson, who is from Act Rochester, and she is an expert on the Poverty Report, and she will be one of our panelists. The third one, I'm sorry,
sorry to say, we don't know yet because it's a fast food worker and they don't even have their schedule for next week. Today's Wednesday, our program is Sunday, and we don't even know. So that's one of their big problems as far as their employment is concerned. But this is the flyer. You already have one, I know, Dan. I just want the people to know that it is open, and we welcome everybody. It's really going to be good. We picked this in the fall for the following March, and I, I am just amazed at the number of articles, the news reports, and so on. It's poverty all over and all the time. And your statistics tonight were just, you know, further proof of it. It's it's a, a horrible, horrible problem. And we really need to put our feet to the pavement and get something done. So thank you. Thank you, Judy. Is there anyone else that would like to address? Yes. Oh, hi. <laughs> I didn't see who that was there in the back. Come on. My name is Audrey Newcomb. <clears throat> I live at 10 Landing Road South, and I'm going to be speaking on the proposal to invite Whole Foods to Brighton. In 1980, Whole Foods opened its first store in Austin, Texas. Its co-founder and now co-CEO, John Mackey, then dreamed of creating an alternative to the dominant corporate supermarket blueprint by offering and popularizing healthy, healthful organic food. Whole Foods started out with an organically grown product model that almost everyone agrees helped expand the organic movement. But some, somewhere along the way, Mackey compromised his, idealist, uh, his idealistic dream by adopting the most unfortunate trappings of consumer capitalism, complete with anti-labor practices disguised as teams and treating competitors as enemies who must be put out of business or swallowed up. Managing food companies like big businesses is certainly the norm these days, but customers are increasingly suspicious of that model. Whole food stores feature local organic foods as a come on with life-size pictures of local organic farmers whose products the store often does not carry, decorating the walls. Fancy organic bins contain food often grown in China and other countries where it is not regulated. Mackey also originated the deceptive business model of carrying roughly half the store's products certified organic and the other half conventionally grown, conventional meaning factory farms with pesticides, antibiotics, and GMOs. Prices of the organic half are jacked up Alongside similar product grown conventionally with prices for the cheaper half also jacked up from which they would cost at from, jacked up from what they would cost at a conventional supermarket. This is a win-win for Whole Foods. No matter which one the cons customer picks, Whole Foods <coughs> no matter yeah. Okay, Whole Foods has been caught labeling local conventional foods as organic and foods from other states and beyond as local. The concept local doesn't fit Mackey's ethos, ethos, nor does the concept of fossil fuel induce climate change. At its 2006 annual board meeting, shareholders proposed adopting green building policies and excluding products containing BPA and other endocrine, endocrine disrupting chemicals. These proposals were refused by Mackey without even allowing board members to make their case under pressure from customers. Mackey finally took a few BPA items off the shelves, but even today the, that process continues at a snail's pace. Whole Foods' carelessness about meat sources caused the death last summer of an eight-year-old Boston area boy whose parents bought meat lab labeled grass-fed, later tested as contaminated with E. coli. They filed a lawsuit in December against Whole Foods. Three people with confirmed E. coli illnesses due to that meat had already been reported to Whole Foods before the boy's family had even bought the contaminated meat because Whole Foods waited 50 days to discontinue meat from the producer. The Massachusetts Department of Public Health, in an email to the boy's mother, accused Whole Foods of grasping its straws and dragging its feet 
in an attempt to avoid doing a recall. I got that quote from the New Yorker, February 15th, 2015. Neither Whole Foods nor government regulators bothered to be curious about the fact that the grass that the cattle in the faraway Missouri cattle operation were fed had been fertilized with sewage sludge. The town of Brighton has led the way with a fracking ban and hands down has the best suburban farmer's market in the county, which attracts a large number of local organic growers. Well, these farmers and other small businesses in the county specializing in certified organic food and who make a point of working with local organic growers be able to survive another big business competitor? Local organic agriculture is the future we need because factory farming is not sustainable. It uses huge amounts of fossil fuels and spoils the land with pesticides and chemical fertilizers. We're 25 years behind in our efforts to combat climate change. Federal and state governments are taking baby steps. Thank you, Governor Cuomo, for ban banning fracking. But if our state becomes the hub for fracking trains and natural gas exports under your watch, it will hasten global warming and raise our own gas prices. It's up to us here locally to make sure our decisions benefit not only our town and our metropolitan area, but also our future on the earth. Growth is John Mackey's plan for a future he doesn't think we have to worry about. He plans to grow the 408 stores he already owns now to 100 more by 2017. Let's think about this before Brighton agrees to being a part of that statistic. <coughs> Please enter my comments into the public record for tonight's comments. Thank you, Audrey. Is there one, anyone else that would like to address the town board during the open forum? Then if not, we will uh, continue with the uh, remainder of the agenda. And can I have a motion to approve uh, the agenda with the addition of the uh, uh, communication that uh, Audrey Newcomb uh, just submitted? So moved. Second. Please call the roll. Councilmember Vogel. Aye. Councilmember Novros. Aye. Councilmember DePonzio. Aye. Councilmember Werner. Aye. Supervisor Maley. Aye. Uh, next uh, is the continuation of the public hearing on the incentive zoning and rezoning application for the University of Rochester's proposed institutional plan development project um, in the um, so-called South Campus uh, area of uh, the university's campus in West Brighton. Um, that public hearing uh, is a continuation of a previous hearing that was uh, previously noticed, and we do have representatives from the university here tonight. Uh, is there anyone that would like to address the board um, on this public hearing at this time? Once again, I will tell you that we will not be taking action on this project tonight, but I think it's fair to say we're getting closer. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to address the public <coughs> hearing on the U of R institutional plan development? Anyone on the board? Then we will uh, continue this public hearing for at least one more meeting. Um, but for tonight, I uh, declare it to be closed. And we'll move on to Communications, can I have a motion to receive and file the communications again with the addition of the uh, correspondence from Audrey Newcomb? So moved. Second. We do have a number of um, communications uh, concerning uh, the proposed Clover Lanes redevelopment project. Um, we also have uh, correspondence from uh, Judge Karen Morris with the annual report of our Brighton Town <coughs> Court for 2014. Um, that full report is also available if anybody would like to read it. Any further uh, comment on uh, any of the communication? I see that there's a series of uh, uh, the letters pro and con of the so-called Clover uh, uh, yeah. Correct. Lanes development, yeah. and, uh, and they will be studied in detail. Absolutely. Um, we have a motion and a second. Uh, if there's nothing further, please call the roll. Councilmember Vogel? Aye. Councilmember Novros? Aye. 
Councilmember DePonzio? Aye. Councilmember Werner? Aye. Supervisor Maley? Aye. Committee reports. Louise, Parks, Recreation, and Community Services. Parks, Recreation, and Community Services Committee has not met since the <coughs> last uh, town board meeting. And uh, the next meeting will be on the 23rd of March at um, Brookside School, 4.30 in the afternoon. Public is welcome. Thanks, Louise. Chris, Finance Administrative Services. The Finance Administrative Services Committee met last <coughs> Tuesday, March the 3rd. Uh, all matters discussed, save one, are on tonight's agenda, so we'll discuss those individually. Uh, the one thing that uh, was of great note, I thought, uh, and I note again amongst our claims, uh, the consumption of salt uh, this winter has been uh, extreme. Uh, this has been an extreme winter. Uh, and uh, Tim uh, Keefe indicated that of the $257,575 budgeted for the 2015 assault expenditure, we've used 97% uh, of it, uh, and this is March. Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, Commissioner Keefe uh, assures us that uh, we have got plenty of salt on hand, much different than many other towns that r ran dry totally. Uh, I know tonight we've got uh, claims of $67,000 for salt as well, but the, uh, the, the process uh, involves uh, ordering our salt ahead of time, uh, and we bid at a state-controlled rate, the state contract rate, which is about $46 a ton. And uh, we take at least 90% uh, delivery during the year, otherwise we actually get a back charge for storage if we don't take uh, at least 90%. But we can order 120% of what, uh, excuse me, we can buy 120%, I understand, of uh, what we've initially reserved uh, without change in the price. And uh, Commissioner Chief has done, or, uh, Keefe has done a great job of uh, keeping us in supply and keeping it within uh, reasonable rates. Uh, and uh, the salt is there in the salt barn if you want to look at it. Uh, <laughs> it's, you know, it's hard to remember, Chris, but just uh, um, two winters ago, we were at the opposite end of that spectrum, um, facing the prospect of having to order salt and store it here that we didn't need because we had such a mild winter. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, kudos uh, to, uh, to Tim and to Tim Anderson um, for having uh, you know, planned well and, and made sure that we uh, conserved our salt. We have not had to go into that higher spot market. We've been able to buy all of our salt at the yep. uh, state uh, contract price. And we appear to have enough to get us through the rest a of the year. A lot left in the barn. The, uh, that's, that's the very good news. Uh, next meeting will be uh, Tuesday, March 17 at uh, 3.30 p.m. and it will be in the stage conference room behind us here. You know, we may have some high school students here in the audience. I just want you to know there are some traditional things that you do to get snow days. Please don't do any of those things. We <laughs> do not need any more snow. <laughs> we can't afford it. All right. Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, public safety. Jason. Uh, we met uh, yesterday morning um, in the lower level community meeting room. And uh, as we do in all of our meetings, we have a networking session in which the various public safety agencies serving the town of Brighton have an opportunity to exchange information. Uh, of note during the networking session, uh, Brighton Fire Department talked about the Adopt a Hydrant program with this year's heavy snowpack. Now, residents have been encouraged to adopt a hydrant in their neighborhood, keep it clear of snow. Uh, that way it can be accessed in the event of an emergency. And actually, the fire marshal reported that the town is in the process of updating our website to have, an to have interactive information on our website so that neighbors will, it'll be easier for them to adopt a hydrant. That way you can look and you can find where the closest one is on your street. Uh, it's, not up, it's not fully functional right now, but hopefully the snow will be gone soon. But hopefully in time for next year's snowpack, that'll be functional and, neighborhood, and neighbors will be able to uh, participate in that program. Uh, the Brighton Police also reported on the special events, as we often do, uh, reviewing when we have to shut down streets uh, for various uh, items that take place in the town. Uh, one of our longstanding events that took place at MCC, the Tour de Cure, is actually moving out to Webster. Uh, it's a great event. Um, unfortunately, I mean, going through MCC and the heavily traveled highways around there, it was um, logistically uh, challenging, but uh, they'll be going out to Webster. I imagine they're going to be planning their longer routes then going out into Wayne County uh, from that location, uh, so that will, that will uh, ease some of the impacts upon uh, our resources in order to, uh, host, in, in order to uh, hold that event. 
Uh, additionally, actually mentioning uh, liking the Brighton Police Department on Facebook, there was an incident that was reported, uh, I mean an unfortunate incident that actually had a good result involving um, our participation in, the, in, in uh, the officers carrying Narcan, which is administered in the event of an opiate addiction. And I'll actually hand off to, to Chief Henderson to talk a little bit more about, uh, about that. Thanks, Jason. Uh, as we reported via Facebook, in early March, Officer Ryan Lehigh came upon uh, a situation in which an individual in a vehicle had stopped breathing, breathing and CPR was being performed. Um, last year, the uh, New York State Attorney General made available to police agencies the availability for training and uh, the issuance of naloxone, which is the prescribed name, and Narcan is the... Uh, uh, brand name that, that people know it as. What this naloxone does is it immediate, immediately counteracts the effects of an opiate overdose. Um, Officer Lehigh, as are all the sworn members, myself included, uh, are trained and certified and prescribed to carry naloxone. It's a controlled substance. Uh, he came upon this situation, very quickly determined that it was an opiate overdose. He took quick, decisive action. He administered the, the antidote naloxone which immediately counteracted the effects of the overdose. The person was transported to Strong Memorial Hospital, treated and released, 100% uh, recovered. Uh, we were pleased to announce via the, the Facebook post with a picture of Officer uh, Lehigh announcing uh, the success of this interaction. Um, we have, uh, uh, the way we operate, we, there's an awards committee. We have play, uh, put the actions of Officer Lehigh into this awards committee and hopefully soon we'll be able to present Officer Lehigh with a formal life-saving award. But uh, uh, we were pleased to report to the community this, this interaction. Uh, we am also pleased to announce that Lee, Ryan has set the Facebook like record uh, <laughs> with, with that. I, so I'm learning more about Facebook as we go, but uh, it, it's a great program. Um, it's something that we will uh, carry with us now moving forward, hopefully this period of uh, overdoses, uh, it's, it's at an epidemic level right now, will peak, and then we won't have the need for it, but we, we will continue to carry the, the antidote. Thanks, Mark. And uh, the next date, the, our, 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 the date time of our next meeting, we meet on the second Tuesday of the month. That will be Tuesday, April 14th. We meet at 8 a.m. in the lower level community meeting room, and the public is invited to attend. Thank you, Jason, and thank you, Mark. Jim, Public Works. Public Works uh, <clears throat> met uh, this week, March 9th. Uh, at that time, uh, we had during the open forum a um, project engineer request an opportunity to discuss the Pinnacle Hill subdivision with the Public Works Committee, in which they did. And uh, they reviewed some of the uh, recommendations that were uh, discussed at the planning board review of their project. And uh, we uh, are going to be looking at that as a committee. and. Uh, We'll uh, be making our own determinations as to uh, the appropriateness of uh, any recommendations that they have with regard to this project. The uh, Under old business, we had uh, sanitary sewers uh, uh, project, the Westfall Heights Sanitary Sewers. This is out in West uh, Brighton. The residents of Westfall Heights subdivision uh, submitted an informal petition which suggested that the approximately 70% of the homes in the area supported the construction of public sewers to serve their properties. Uh, the, uh, uh, in response to that, the town has submitted a funding application to the New York State Clean Waters State Revolving Fund Municipal Point Source and Non-Point Source Project Listing. <laughs> that is a mouthful. Uh, that, I'll abbreviate it, CWSRF provides low interest loans for extended time periods. So more to follow on that, uh, Bill. And uh, the farmer's market, uh, we had an RFP process update. The town board authorized a preparation and solicitation of a request for a proposal for professional consulting services <coughs> on November 26th of, May of this past year for the town of Brighton's farmer's market project. Now, six responses were uh, received uh, to that request uh, as of the end of December. And after reviewing the proposals and interviewing the top three <coughs> consultants, the selection committee has recommended the Insight uh, Architecture for the project. That's an uh, organization and company. Uh, the next item uh, is the matter of sanitary sewers in the Farview Hills update. Now that is a property along Farview Hill, just off of uh, you know South Clinton, 
by, uh, is served by a private combined sewer system. Now these residential properties are not incorporated in the, in the town, uh, town sanitary sewer district, and there is no method to fund the operation and maintenance of the sewer, sanitary sewer collection system that they have. So the town of Brighton is proposing to form the Farview Hills Road Sewer District to provide a method to fund the operation and maintenance costs uh, incurred with the sanitary sewer system. We've mailed a copy of this uh, petition to the residents along Farview Hill Road for signature and we'll proceed with the district formation once the sign of petitions are returned from the residents. Uh, the town would be taking that action. The next item again is sanitary sewers, this time in Collinsworth. This is over in East Brighton. The owner at uh, 59 Collinswood has indicated their septic system has failed and they wish to construct a low pressure pump station to connect them to the sanitary sewer four main along Collinsworth Drive, their, their street. The four main is owned and operated by the town of Penfield and uh, uh, these improvements will be installed by the property owner and the cost of these improvements shall be borne by the property owner at no cost to the town. We've received a signed petition requesting an extension to the sewer district that existing agreement between the town of Penfield and Brighton, town of Brighton uh, amended to accommodate this uh, district extension. Now on this agreement, once it's finalized, we will proceed with the district formation process. Uh, the last item, or I should say the next item was under new business and the comprehensive plan, uh, an RFP update. The town of Brighton requested proposals for, for, pres for uh, professional consulting services for the preparation of comprehensive plan update of the original comprehensive plan of 2000. Now the town has received three responses and a subcommittee of the comp plan committee will be reviewing the responses in the coming weeks. Uh, the last item was having to do with trees. Uh, we had a, a tree at one, well, one at 100 Edgeview Lane and another one at 376 Meadow Drive. The Public Works Committee reviewed the tree evaluations and recommendations and con concur with the report findings. Both of these trees must be removed. They, they're becoming a safety hazard. In other words, their, their hazard rating is high enough that we need to take action on these. And we will be doing that in the coming weeks. The next committee meeting will be Tuesday, April 7th at 9 a.m. in the lower level community meeting room. And again, as uh, we've all said, these uh, committees are open to the public. One of, those, uh, one of those two trees had already had a replacement uh, tree planted nearby, but we yeah. will make sure both of them have uh, nearby replacements. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned the uh, InSight uh, architecture, the uh, Brighton Farmers Market uh, uh, contract, and that will be on our agenda, agenda tonight. in We're just right. a moment. Yep. Yeah. Thank Good. you for that, Jim. Um, we have no old business, new business. Chris, reading and approval of claims. <clears throat> uh, Bill, I've reviewed claims totaling $415,589.34 tonight. Uh, amongst them, which uh, caught my eye at least, uh, were the uh, large uh, $67,000 for uh, salt. Uh, and uh, Suzanne has uh, handed me a note indicating that in 2015, we actually budgeted 5,200 tons of salt, uh, untreated salt, and another 200 of uh, treated salt as well. We go through a lot. Uh, and uh, also, I noted that uh, the two, uh, two claims for uh, our new Bobcat uh, uh, machines, uh, again, that's a, an interesting uh, trade-in program that we have. These are one-year-old machines that we've gotten a tremendous trade-in price on that the uh, commissioner had his eye out uh, for a bargain. And for $4,500, we have traded our two one-year-old machines for brand new machines. These are about $38,000 each. So that's well below the, the uh, amortized uh, uh, value of these pieces of equipment. Uh, so that's very interesting to see. $30,000 worth of fuel. And the one item I've never seen before, and I think this is what I learned new today, uh, Ken Metal or KenCast parts, some $17,800 for these parts. And Suzanne, again, uh, at my inquiry, uh, uh, advises me that this is composite material used to uh, avert or reduce abrasive wear on steel. Uh, they're attached to uh, snowplow blades, and then they increase the life of the blades by some 30%, and the snowplow shoe life up to 10 times longer. So I'd never seen this. Uh, uh, I also use it for cloning. Can cast. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I see the pictures on your computer. <laughs> Uh, but some uh, $17,000 for those. 
uh, but uh, reviewing them, I, I believe them to be in order, and I move that they be approved for payment. Second. Yeah. Discussion? Please call the roll. Councilmember Vogel? Aye. Councilmember Novros? Aye. Councilmember DePonzio? Aye. Councilmember Werner? Aye. Supervisor Maley? Aye. Next item on the agenda uh, is a proposed uh, approval of the amended incentive zoning application for Jewish Senior Life's project on Winton Road. We do have a representative of Jewish Senior Life, I believe, here tonight. Um, can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Now the, uh, the floor is open for any discussion. This is, um, we've heard uh, a, a very uh, comprehensive description of this proposal <coughs> to move beds out of the tower and into greenhouse buildings on the property site as well as to <coughs> construct a new um, independent living uh, building on that site. It amends uh, an incentive zoning approval that was given for the campus all the way back in 1996. It's received extensive staff review. It's been through public hearing uh, on this board. Uh, seeker is uh, been uh, complied with um, and uh, so you now have this motion I have Good. a couple of questions go ahead Jerry questions <laughs> yeah I might as well continue on this bring the engineer up with me good evening okay um, with all the incentive zoning as as Bill had said in his speech tonight uh, there, there doesn't seem to be any provision for, um, for affordable housing. There was, um, there is no specific provision for affordable housing. The qualifications for entry into these houses are regulated by the state, so we'll comply with state regulations as it, uh, as it applies. Is that acceptable? Well, can we that's, that's, do anything about that's it? That's what is the... Okay. Uh, um, now, this is a little bit different than, than many, in, you know, incentive zoning proposals that we okay. receive. And um, now, this is going to be according to the comp plan that is currently in, in effect. Does anything happen or it, can any changes be made if the new comp plan has a different take on, on any of the, um, any of the cultural or social things that were done for your project? The comprehensive plan did not address land use in this particular area in the uh, 19, to, excuse me, 2000, 2001 plan. Uh, we don't anticipate that there would be any review of this particular project. Certainly, uh, as a skilled nursing facility, uh, we will do whatever we can to facilitate things for our residents in accordance with the mandates of the Department of Health. Okay. And I guess the one other thing that I would say is although um, Jerry is right that there were no land use recommendations with respect to this parcel, um, as noted in the uh, proposed resolution, um, it, uh, this project uh, with approval w would include a finding that it does uh, further the goal included in that comprehensive plan of providing um, housing and uh, uh, you know other services for uh, for seniors so although there is no specific land use recommendation uh, for that property uh, providing elder care facilities was one of the goals one of the objectives uh, listed in that kind of <laughs> certainly does Yes. Um, in one of the, in number two of the, of the, of the resolution, it says uh, the proposal will allow JSL to meet current standards of care while allowing for further evolution of the campus. What do you mean by uh, current standards of care? Current standards of care is the provision of care which is currently being provided at, at JSL. This is a different model of providing those services by having the greenhouse um, situation. The greenhouses do allow for a skilled nursing 
uh, facility on a floor by floor basis as opposed to in a more larger building and setting. So our objective is to provide quality care um, in the skilled nursing realm uh, in just a different model. And, and that care and that uh, is, is regulated by state and by federal and a that is correct. AMA. That's correct. Actually, actually, the State Department of Health really is the agency that uh, that does regulate the most relative to this. Okay. Um, I have a couple more questions here. And uh, let's see, the, the conditions set forth herein may be altered, modified, or removed only upon written consent of the town board of the town of Brighton and the applicant at any time. Um, that is standard language in the six incentive zonings I've been involved in. It's been in every resolution. It can be amended only on the consent of both parties, both the town board and the applicant. So, for example, we are, in fact, now amending a previous incentive zoning approval covering this land from 96. So we're following, one of the things we're doing is following the procedures at that time. It's something that um, they can't do unilaterally. Um, we need to approve. Right. I saw um, the attorney for the U of R before, and I said, there's your answer about <laughs> we're when we are approving things that for 50 years from now, but are we really? And that's... I well, there's, all, you know, land use and, and everything is a dynamic process. There, there may be changes which require us to look again, and, and if we all agree, it just gives us the ability to do that. Uh, and the last question I have is, is number nine, it's really for, for Ken, that any agreements required to be executed under the terms of these conditions shall be in form and substance as Sorry, may... number nine of the... She's C on... Uh, probably C2. C2. Probably C2. Um, where was I? Uh, shall be in the form and substance as may be approved by the attorney for the town. What about the town board? The... Right. Um, so that the conditions may be altered or removed only upon written consent of the town board of the town of Brighton is number eight. She's asking about number nine, the, the attorney approval for uh, uh, any other uh, conditions. I mean, this, this yeah, resolution so authorizes uh, the execution of certain uh, agreements, and this language that paragraph nine simply indicates that um, what we are saying is, as we often do, that when we authorize the supervisor to sign an agreement, that agreement is subject to the review of the town attorney. And that's all that this. Yeah, I don't have any policy. If, if your question is, yeah. you know, does this somehow give me some sort of policy making jurisdiction, the answer is no and you could not divest yourself of that authority in any event. Um, so uh, this, like many of our um, resolutions, uh, the board is making policy. The board is setting the terms of the agreement. Um, it's up to me and staff and, and Ramsey and I, uh, and along with Council for uh, Jewish Senior Life, have been working closely uh, to make sure that the language is crafted in such a way that it meets the requirements that we expect the town board uh, to be approving this evening. And in this case, that's primarily the uh, payment in lieu of tax agreement that right, is we've referenced got an amenity in agreement. paragraph two of schedule C1. Right. Um, so our job is to make sure that um, the agreement that is actually executed, the formal document, complies with the policy and decisions that the town board as a whole makes. That's no different than any of our other resolutions and agreements. And specifically, that would include the formula that is set forth in detail there in uh, Section 2 of Schedule C. Schedule C. Mm -hmm. Uh, Bill, I, would, I just wanted to note that uh, I think that the, uh, uh, the Jewish home and Jewish uh, senior life uh, is a tremendous asset uh, to Brighton. My own family has received care there. 
uh, and I note with, with respect to this change is that we're largely replacing what would have been medical offices uh, that were anticipated initially to more service beds. Uh, actually, not more, and that is not a concern more. of mine, but, uh, but I understand that we're going to be, or you, the, the, the home will be reducing from 362 to 328 beds, a net loss of 34 beds. Sherry, have you got any thoughts on uh, Essentially, it's a reallocation of the model. What, what is being done is that a lot of things are being spread out, whereas the model previously was to have a mix of single rooms and double rooms. The objective is for the rooms to be in the tower to be single rooms. So the, the net result is that that skilled nursing aspect of things, which is regulated by the State Department of Health in which they're considering a certificate of need uh, for this, uh, is is the model that they think they can provide the best service on. All right, well, I'm glad to see it. I know my mother-in-law was in a double room, and it didn't seem, to, it was fine. Uh, yeah. But a, a single room would have been much and, more And it's not, and the single room and double room is not necessarily a question of comfort, but a question of trying to uh, contain anything which may be contagious and trying to keep it within, within individual rooms. There were issues there. Uh, but I do know that with this change, and I think it's a positive change, that it's anticipated that uh, we're going to receive $75,000 to the Parkland Trust uh, and then $40,000 a year payment in lieu of taxes. Adjusted we'll annually. Be indexed for inflation. <laughs> <laughs> for inflation all, the, yes. all, all the lawyers in the room and the administration <laughs> are very <laughs> quick to say that. about the adjustment, yes. So, uh, I'm, and, uh, I'm in favor of this. So. I'm going to ask uh, Andy to come up to the Great. podium. Come on up in. He's a landscape architect. I think it's important because we go through these and uh, the public will tune in and tune out or they may not have watched these meetings in the past. Uh, I think it'd be important, Andy, to explain the attention that is being paid to proper buffering and landscaping of this construction of this development and, uh, you know, the extent that you're taking to ensure that this is not just a meaningful addition to the Jewish home, but also uh, an improvement in the, in the landscape. Um, sure, let me see if I can kind of capture that in, in as few words as possible, if you will. Um, the whole redevelopment of the campus is to uh, essentially turn the focus from uh, the tower out to the buildings in. Um, so the positioning of the greenhouses kind of circling around the tower uh, then creates quite a bit of green space uh, between the tower and them, and then the buildings themselves create a little bit of buffer to the outside world, uh, uh, traffic on, uh, on the surrounding road network. Um, but what is also being included is extensive amount of landscaping. Uh, the green infrastructure practices will be uh, forthcoming as part of the stormwater management program uh, and requirements through the DEC. Um, and all those areas will be planted with native materials. There'll be uh, uh, much more flora, much more fauna that it will be attracted to the site. Uh, and there will be quite a bit more landscape, planted landscape bufferings along both road networks. Again, to uh, create a campus uh, instead of a, a tower in a, a sea of lawn, if you will. I don't know if that... <clears throat> yeah, I, and again, I understand this, but uh, we've been working on this with you for a number of <laughs> weeks and months. I think it's kind of important sometimes we slow down and, and review again for the public consumption. Exactly. What are they doing? You know. All right. Thank you. For the benefit of, of the public, as the board knows, this matter also comes before the town planning board right. before final approval is, um, is made on the project sufficient to be able to construct. And during that process, the planning board does review uh, landscaping and drainage and aesthetics of that nature. In addition, it does go to the town's architectural review board that reviews exterior elevations. And lest we forget the conservation board as well. The conservation board is advisory to the planning board. Right. Uh, the ARB and the planning board have final approval authority, yes. Thanks. And, and what we're considering tonight is simply a change of the zoning that would permit this sort of use. The actual use itself is going to be subject to that whole process. That's right. correct. And as and was alluded, this is really simply a change to a concept 20, close to 20 years ago when the expectation was that a, an office building would provide 
uh, on a for-profit basis, services that would be relevant to residents there, uh, time, time has really changed the vision. And no uh, we have, you've come to us, asked that we uh, make these amendments to the prior approval to reflect that. And um, the review process yeah. has, you know, certainly from my perspective, uh, has determined that it makes sense to make that change. Well, thank you. I just have a question about uh, about future certificates of need. Hopefully I can phrase the question in a way that is comprehensible to people who will be able to answer it. Yes. I know that uh, the number of beds at these facilities is regulated by the State Department of Health. There's a whole certificate of need process. Yes. So in the future, if it's determined by the Jewish Home of Rochester that they wish to convert, say, some of these now single rooms into doubles, so they want to have more beds, that'll require an application to the Department of Health for the certificate of need, but then will that also require an amendment to this incentive zoning approval? The incentive zoning approval as it's drafted has a cap on the number of, of beds which are allowed for skilled nursing. Thank you. Okay. Very good point. Yeah. Great. Any further questions? We have a motion. Uh, it's been seconded on the floor. If there are no further comments, Dan, please call the roll. Councilmember Vogel? Aye. Councilmember Novros? Aye. Councilmember DePonzio? Aye. Councilmember Werner? Aye. Supervisor Maley? Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you, board members, for your uh, you know, good questions tonight. Uh, next matter, Jim. Next matter is to uh, uh, authorize the supervisor to execute an amendment to the agreement with Bear Architecture for uh, services related to the shared use trail for the additional services to include cultural resource study together with approval to transfer $2,375 from the Parkland Trust <coughs> Engineering Services account to support the additional funds needed for the additional services required. I move on the resolution. As prepared by the attorney to the town. Second. Thanks, Jim. Um, this agreement uh, is required based on the fact that, based on a phase 1A cultural resource study, the State Historic Preservation Office, otherwise known as SHPO, um, has required a so called phase 1B cultural resource survey which will involve some additional digging on the site to determine artifacts or anything of the sort. Um, we don't expect that they will find any, uh, but they required a 1B at the south end of that parcel when the uh, landing of Brighton senior facility was constructed. So th these funds simply support the relatively small additional cost of doing that work. It will also, unfortunately, involve a little time. But as we know, that can be the nature of the beast. Again. I'm really itchy to get this trail in. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic that we'll get through this process and uh, be able to start construction. Any thought of when we might be able to start construction, Bill, on that? Late this summer is, uh, Late is summer? the goal. Yeah. Yeah. It would be great to do it sooner, but realistically, given the need to yeah. finalize all the environmental review, some of these requirements. We need the snow to melt so they can <laughs> That's a start. <laughs> yes. That's the big thing. So we have a uh, motion and a second. Further discussion? Please call the roll. Councilmember Vogel? Aye. Councilmember Novros? Aye. Councilmember DePonzio? Aye. Councilmember Werner? Aye. Supervisor Maley? Aye. Uh, Jason? Next matter is for approval to accept $600 from funding from Lifespan of Greater Rochester with authorization to increase police budget revenue, public safety account to support expenditure of same. I move we adopt the resolution as prepared by the attorney to the town. Second. Chief Henderson has reported on this numerous times in the past, but uh, our uh, police officers have been trained through lifespan, and um, they have provided us with uh, funding to support our police activities in the reflection of, uh, you know, our willingness to, to get our officers trained in these senior-related uh, activities. Thank you, lifespan. Um, we have a motion and a second. Further discussion? 
Please call the roll. <coughs> Councilmember Vogel. Aye. Councilmember Novros. Aye. Councilmember DePonzio. Aye. Councilmember Werner. Aye. Supervisor Maley. Aye. Chris. Uh, the next item, Bill, is to uh, execute an agreement with Insight uh, Architecture <coughs> to provide professional services associated with the year-round uh, Brighton Farmers Market project. I move that we adopt the resolution as prepared by the attorney for the town. Second. As discussed earlier, and Louise was a part of the committee, um, we reviewed these various um, proposals, inside architecture. Uh, we, you can say it better than I can, Louise. You were, you were there. But, uh, we interviewed three different firms, and uh, this one seemed to meet our needs the best, and they are very excited to do it, and they have, a, they have done markets before, and they have some insight on how to reuse some of the material that's in the barns, the wood, and, and so forth. And it sounds like it's going to be a really fascinating project when they're through with it. Thanks, Louise. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Dan, please call the roll. Councilmember Vogel? Aye. Councilmember Novros? Aye. Councilmember DePonzio? Aye. Councilmember Werner? Aye. Supervisor Manley? Aye. Chris? Uh, Bill, the next item is to authorize the supervisor to ex execute an agreement with Raymond F. Wager to provide special review services relating to the Brighton uh, Police Department's property room uh, inventory. I move that we adopt the resolution as prepared by the attorney for the town. Second. Discussion? Mark, can you uh, uh, review this for us? Yes, this was a request that was made. Um, we do an annual internal audit of the property room. Uh, Council. Uh, and you and I had, had a discussion about how that practice is and how a property room works. In the interim, the state comptroller had issued a report relative to some property rooms across the state, uh, one close by us here in Irondequoit, and uh, talked about the need uh, in some of the uh, audits for uh, review and policy procedures. Um, I had inquired if the auditors, while they were here doing their, their standard uh, town audit, if they could include that property room as part of the process. Um, uh, and Suzanne, you can help me here. That they felt that this would be something above and beyond. Uh, it'll, uh, I do not suspect at all that we have a problem in the property room. I think what this will show is that our practices are best practices and that when they do a sampling audit of the, of the property room, they'll report back to you the, the integrity of the property room structure that we have at the Brighton Police Department. At a finance committee meeting, uh, we had a discussion of uh, uh, was there an audit done regularly of the property room? Uh, I think I'd seen something on television uh, uh, in a movie, actually, but as it turned out, the controller was already uh, uh, auditing some of the okay. property rooms, and the uh, chief uh, volunteered for uh, uh, Jason and I to just simply drop in uh, and he would conduct a spot audit for us of the, uh, of the room and uh, before we could get to it because of intervening vacations, uh, the, the, he had already arranged a full audit from the, uh, uh, for the town auditors. I see it's going to cost an additional $1,500, but I think it's something well worth doing. Uh, these are things of value that are there. They can be subject to uh, being removed improperly and uh, it, uh, I think it just makes for a tighter uh, administration overall. Further discussion? We have a motion and a second. Dan, please call the roll. Councilmember Vogel? Aye. Councilmember Novros? Aye. Councilmember DePonzio? Aye. Councilmember Werner? Aye. Supervisor Maley? Aye. Uh, I need to go back uh, to the earlier item uh, relating to the Phase 1B Cultural Resource Study for the Shared Use Trail. Um, there's a reference to the funding source uh, in the printed resolution, it references the Parkland Reserve Fund twice. That should have referenced <coughs> actually the Parkland Trust Fund. Uh, now that motion was made by. Uh, it's uh, marked. Right, it's uh, marked on there. Uh, oh yes, uh, by Jim, seconded by uh, Chris. Do you uh, accept? Yes. That uh, yeah. as a as a friendly. That's in uh, accordance with the summary. That uh, correct. Correct. Yeah. So, um, uh, Ken, do we need to take another vote yes, on that? Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, if we could what I, what I would, yeah, what I would ask is that the matter be uh, recalled for reconsideration. Okay. Can I have a vote on that? Uh, can I have a motion then to uh, reconsider uh, that that item? So moved. Oh, yeah. Second. Yeah. Uh, 
please the vote on the reconsideration. Simply to, to recall it to reconsider it. Please call the roll, Dan. Councilmember Vogel. Aye. Councilmember Novros. Aye. Councilmember DePonzio. Aye. Councilmember Werner. Aye. Supervisor Manley. Aye. And now can we have uh, we have a, a an agreement uh, to from the, the mover friend, friendly am amendment from the mover and the seconder to uh, vote on that resolution with the sole change of reference in two places, uh, referencing the Parkland Trust Fund rather than the Parkland Reserve Fund. I'll move on that resolution again. And I also accept the amendment. Good. Uh, Dan, please call the roll. Councilmember Vogel. Aye. Councilmember Novros. Aye. Councilmember DePonzi. Aye. Councilmember Werner. Aye. Supervisor Manley. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next item, Louise. Uh, the next item is to is for approval to designate Ma Michael Guyon, our town engineer, and staff liaison to, to the Sustainability Oversight Committee as a Climate Smart Community Coordinator. I move on the resolution as prepared by the attorney to the town. Second. As we um, continue to develop our presence as a climate smart community, um, there are a number of action items that uh, the program uh, expects local communities to commit to. Um, we have long had a very active sustainability oversight committee and Mike Guyon has long been our staff liaison to that committee with help from Chris as our town board liaison. Sitting there right now, I believe. Uh, yes, he is. Um, in climate smart community lingo, they would like us to also designate him in this position as climate smart community coordinator. and. Uh, Mike is the natural person to do it, and uh, we have a motion and a second to do that. Uh, if there's <coughs> discussion, anybody? Dan, please call the roll. Councilmember Vogel. Aye. Councilmember Novros. Aye. Councilmember DePonzio. Aye. Councilmember Warner. Aye. Supervisor Mealy. Aye. Jim. The uh, next item is to uh, approve a declaration of a snowblower attachment and a file cabinet from the highway department as surplus and disposed of as junk and declare a particular welder as a surplus with approval to use as a trade-in on new equipment. I move in the resolution as prepared by the attorney to the town. Second. Discussion? Please call the roll. Councilmember Vogel? Aye. Councilmember Novros? Aye. Councilmember DePonzio? Aye. Councilmember Werner? Aye. Supervisor Malin? Aye. Uh, Louise? But the next item is to authorize the budget transfer <laughs> from the recreation part-time wages account of $500 to support additional funds to increase the farmer's market and community garden contracted services accounts. I move on the resolution as prepared by the attorney to the town. Second. This uh, simply makes the accounting uh, budget uh, transfers to reflect the approval that I think we did at the last meeting um, in, in which um, uh, the contractual consideration to Sue Gardner-Smith for her dual roles as farmer's market director and community garden was increased by that same $500. Anything further? Discussion? We'll check on the second on that. Uh, uh, Jason. Mr. Ponzio. And with that, you can call the roll. Councilmember Vogel. Aye. Councilmember Novros. Aye. Councilmember DePonzio. Aye. Councilmember Werner. Aye. Supervisor Manley. Aye. Chris. Well, the next item is to authorize an amendment of the 2015 capital budget to include uh, any appropriated uh, or slash reappropriated unexpected balances and interest earned in years prior to 2015 for all ongoing capital projects. I move that we adopt the resolution as prepared by the attorney for the town. Second. Suzanne. Just an accounting function of our financial system um, that closes out our capital fund at year end and we just want to because these are ongoing projects that don't have anything to do with calendar year end we just want to reappropriate those balances from year end 2014. Thank you very much this is something we do about this time every year different different accounts sometimes different numbers but same process. Uh, we have motion and a second further discussion please call the roll. Councilmember Vogel. Aye. Councilmember Novros. Aye. Councilmember DePonzio. Aye. Councilmember Werner? Aye. Supervisor Manley? Aye. Louise? The last matter is to adopt a bond resolution. Nope. No, 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 no. Oops, sorry. 
Yeah. Authorize approval to seek lead agency status. Lead <laughs> Sorry. This is an, uh, to authorize approval to seek lead agency status for the Brighton Town Board pursuant to the State Environmental Quality Review Act or seeker for the shared use trail project. I move on the resolution as prepared by the attorney to the town. Second. And again, this is part of that environmental review that we discussed that will be probably the final step before we are shovel in the ground That's across great. the street for this great trail. Great. Um, I, Dan, uh, please call the roll. Councilmember Vogel. Aye. Councilmember Novros. Aye. Councilmember DePonzio. Aye. Councilmember Werner. Aye. Supervisor Maley. Aye. Uh, Chris. Bill, the next item is to adopt bond resolutions for various highway departmental capital expenditures. I move that we adopt the uh, resolution as prepared by the attorney for the town. And in this case, there are actually three separate bond resolutions um, that are prepared by bond council. Uh, one relates to um, uh, windows and uh, uh, other work at the uh, Department of Public Works building, as we've discussed through the capital improvement project. Um, on cold days, they're wearing parkas in there. And yeah. That's obviously uh, uh, simply not fair, but also obviously wasteful from an energy perspective. Um, another one relates to the reconstruction and or replacement of a culvert on Fairfield Road. Frankly, that project, we are still waiting to determine whether we have to do a full replacement of the culvert or as we hope, uh, the DEC will approve uh, lining of that culvert, which would be uh, less Not expensive cheaper. and less disruptive to traffic. And the third is... Um, Relining or sanitary the, sewer? The, right, the East Avenue uh, sewer relining. I'm gonna second this motion. Good. Discussion. Just on the uh, on the Fairfield culvert issue, um, just to advise the supervisor and the board, uh, finance director and I had a conversation uh, through email with bond council relative to the language being used. Um, the bond resolution authorizes the reconstruction or replacement. Um, it is bond council's opinion that that language is broad enough to include uh, the relining options so that we will not need to come back and ask you for a new resolution on that. I think we say we, re, re, reconstruction and or replacement, uh, which no. if in fact we don't spend, the waterfront. If, if in fact we don't spend uh, all of that $195,000 uh, with the cost savings of relining, uh, the surplus then goes back to reuse the bond? or Actually, we will the know before we issue the bond. This resolution gives us authority, but we will know within a month or so. We expect to issue the bond in June. We should know within about a month whether which one of those two procedures will be used. We will simply issue a smaller bond uh, if but all we have to do is, is line it. That's great. They both have a lengthy, useful life that can be supported here by the bond of this length, 15 years. We have a motion and a second. Anything further? Please call the roll. Councilmember Vogel. Aye. Councilmember Novros. Aye. Councilmember DePonzio. Aye. Councilmember Werner. Aye. Supervisor Maley. Aye. Uh, matters of the supervisor. Um, we have the uh, expense and revenue report. Uh, it is in your packet. Uh, next, uh, as, as always, we'll ask the finance director at the end of the first quarter to give us a more formal report. Tonight, all I need is a motion to receive and file that report. Moved. Second. Uh, discussion? Please call the roll. Councilmember Vogel? Aye. <clears throat> Councilmember Novros? Aye. Councilmember DePonzio? Aye. Councilmember Werner? Aye. Supervisor Maley? Aye. Uh, just a couple of things. We, we've talked a couple times about uh, last night's trail uh, meeting. Uh, I think uh, universally, really, almost uh, everyone that was there uh, liked what they saw, particularly liked some of the uh, interpretive uh, elements, both at the trailhead here on Elmwood Avenue and throughout the trail, uh, reflecting both on the history of that land um, uh, as a integral part of our brick-making operation in the 19th century, but also the rail operations that were in there. Uh, for those that weren't there and 
if you haven't already, I really encourage you to go to a, the website for this trail project, brightontrail.com, and what you will see is a picture of a pond that's right on the uh, home page uh, that is truly spectacular, <laughs> that most Brightonians have never seen because we don't have a trail there. Not only will we have a trail there, but because we're going to be able to take advantage of that old raised narrow gauge rail bed, we will be able to walk right through on that high ground, right through the, 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 the wet area, and you will truly see uh, scenery the likes of which you, you can't expect to find in a, in a developed community like Brighton. So that's why I'm so <laughs> excited. Not only is it beautiful, not only is it environmental, but it's a great piece of Brighton's history. It's like a wildlife reservoir back in there. Oh, it's, it's wonderful. The thing that I was uh, interested in, and the neighbors are very excited <coughs> about it, and one who uh, adjoins it uh, said that uh, they believe that to be a mile distance uh, along that trail. Pretty close. And they were looking forward to uh, using it just for uh, uh, exercise. Yep, walk yep, out, absolutely. Take a walk on it every night, uh, out and back again. The, the path, you know, we established a 100-foot buffer away from anybody's homes, and frankly, we don't even come close. Um, so... We've worked um, with the three significant institutional neighbors, Temple Perth Kodesh, uh, the Church of Latter-day Saints, and the new senior uh, facility, the Landing of Brighton. All of them are excited about this project, uh, and uh, we appreciate their partnership with us in making this great uh, new amenity for the town possible. Uh, the other thing I, I just want to mention real quickly, and we may talk about it a little bit more, um, we talked about it last year as well, and that is the emerald ash borer. Uh, spring is the time of year, if you have ash trees, to consider um, having them treated. We've identified some ash trees right over here in this new park that uh, we are going to have treated. They're a beautiful grove of trees. They're beautiful trees. Uh, they often do grow in wetter areas, and we do have some of those, particularly to the west of Town Hall. The town itself has treated our street trees for the emerald ash borer, but if you're a property owner and are uh, trying to decide, hey, first, do I have any ash trees? Um, there are websites um, that uh, I, I, you, can, you can go to to learn to identify your trees. Um, the licensed arborists in the Monroe County area are all familiar with treatment. There are a couple of different treatment options for emerald ash borer, and um, I, I encourage you, just as we gave it some thought and ultimately decided to go ahead and treat our street trees, um, to, if you have ash trees in your yard, not mountain ash, uh, other types of true ash trees, green ash and the like, um, make a thoughtful decision. Find out if you have them and then decide. Does it make sense for you to treat them? If you do not treat them, they will die. That's the bottom line. The emerald ash borer is present in Monroe County. In fact, it is present in Brighton, uh, starting in the far southwest corner of the town. But there is no doubt that it will spread through the community over the next very short period of years and all ash trees, traditional ash trees that are not treated are 99% certain to be killed by this tiny little half inch bug. So keep that in mind. Think about talking to a licensed arborist, not just somebody that comes down the street with a pickup truck, someone that is a licensed arborist who can walk you through the treatment options. But our tree canopy in Brighton is important. Obviously, our own street trees and our park trees are important, but the private trees in all of our yards are just as important to the character of the community. Um, that's all I have uh, on matters of the supervisor. Uh, Ken, matters of the attorney? I do not have anything, thank Dan, you. Dan, matters of the clerk? I have nothing this evening. Matters of the board? Further. Again, I want to thank our uh, cable TV uh, team, our staff for uh,
putting together the extra work to the state of the town message. I want to again thank our uh, uh, lang sign language interpreter. Um, I saw her out of the corner of my eye as I was talking and I appreciate the opportunity again to communicate to all parts of our community and thank you uh, Suzanne for doing that work. Um, can I have a motion to go into executive session to discuss uh, the employment of a particular person, uh, collective bargaining, and the um, Clover Blossom litigation? Second. <clears throat> Please call the roll. Councilmember Vogel? Aye. Councilmember Novros? Aye. Councilmember DePonzio? Aye. Councilmember Werner? Aye. Supervisor Maley? Aye. We will not be coming back. So uh, into uh, open session after that executive session. So um, thank you for uh, watching tonight. Uh, our next town board meeting is March 25th, right here at 7 o'clock. Have a good evening.